introduce our uh, plenary speaker this morning, who is Dr. Wesley Clark, and many of you know him uh, from SAMHSA. And because I'm still trying to get my staff to print this a little larger so I can actually read it without my glasses, but so far it's not happening. So I'm going to read a little bit about Dr. Clark's background because it's pretty fascinating. He's currently the Dean's Executive Professor of Public Health at Santa Clara University in, not surprisingly, Santa Clara, California. And most of us knew him uh, as the director of the Center for Substance Use Treatment at SAMHSA, which is part of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And while there, he led the agency's national effort to provide effective and accessible treatment to all Americans with addictive disorders, which is a huge task. And now that we in California are working on developing this continuum of care for people with addictive disorders, now we understand how huge that task really is. He is also the former chief of the Associated Substance Abuse Programs at the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs Medical Center in San Francisco and a former associate clinical professor, Department of Psychiatry, University of California at San Francisco. He served as a senior program consultant to the Robert Wood Johnson Substance Abuse Program, co-investigator on a number of National Institute on Drug Abuse funded research grants, and interestingly, I didn't know this about him, he worked for Senator Edward Kennedy as a health counsel on the, at the U.S. Senate Co Committee of Labor and Human Resources. So I'm just going to read a few more things about what he's done. There is an entire paragraph of all the awards he's, read, he's been awarded. So I just want you to know that he's gotten probably every award in substance use policy that exists, <laughs> as far as I can tell. So it, now currently, he subsequently joined the board of directors of the nonprofit Felton Institute, a family service agency in San Francisco. And he's also joined the board of directors of Faces and Voices of Recovery, a group that advocates for the needs of people in recovery from addiction. So he's got a thousand degrees, and I'm just going to read some of them uh, because it's quite impressive. I was asking him, so what do you do in your spare time when you're not working? And he said, is there any time I'm not working? So, and so I suggested that maybe what he needs to do is just go get another degree so he can add to this. So let me read some of the degrees he has. He received a BA in chemistry from Wayne, Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan. He holds a medical degree and a master's in public health from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, where he completed a psychiatric residency at University Hospital Neuropsychiatric Institute. He obtained his Juris Doctorate, a law degree, from Harvard University Law School and completed a two-year substance use Abuse Fellowship at DVAMC-SF. What is that? San Francisco VA. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Dr. Clark received his board certification from the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology in Psychiatry and subspecialty certifications in addiction psychiatry. He is licensed to practice medicine in California, Maryland, Massachusetts, and Michigan. He's also a member of the Washington, D.C. Bar. So... Would you please welcome Dr. Clark. Thank you. Uh, if I can get my slides up. Who's in charge of the slides? Push the button. Ah, the button. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, after so many years in Washington, um, it's a pleasure to be back at state level. Uh, so many people I know, uh, since she mentioned uh, SFVAMC, uh, my former boss, Peter Bannis, is here. Uh, he also worked for me indirectly when uh, he was in Vietnam. So I'd never alienate one of your minions. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, nevertheless, uh, we got along very well, and uh, uh, I've learned a lot about addiction from Peter, but I also have had the opportunity to meet uh, a lot of uh, others of you. So I'm supposed to give a, a presentation to a lot of you who already know everything there is to know about uh, behavioral health, addiction, 
and, uh, and mental health conditions. Our issues are of uh, uh, critical importance to the world. Uh, as mentioned, I'm the Dean's Executive Professor of Public Health at Santa Clara. That means I'm old, and uh, they needed a title to give me, so that's the title I got. I'll be 70 this year, so what the heck. <laughs> I have no conflict of interest. Uh, but one of the things I have noticed since I uh, have left Washington is there's this increased interest in behavioral health. Uh, major newspapers like the New York Times, today there's an article about a young man who uh, hacked someone to death with a machete. Uh, the New York Times has been running this thing about mental health on an ongoing basis. There's an increased interest in what the public sector should be doing to deal with issues of behavioral health, whether it's uh, psychiatric conditions or otherwise. So let's start with some vague reference to uh, California's resources from the federal government. California gets uh, $325 uh, million from SAMHSA, not counting then the amount of money that comes from uh, CMS through Medicaid. So SAMHSA also provides, uh, since I was with SAMHSA, I always found that this would be very important. Discretionary funds, almost $60 million. Total funds, $385 million. And so the question is, is this enough? And the answer is probably not. But there's been an increased interest in serious mental illness. As I pointed out, New York Times just did their thing today. They're going to do the thing on killings in the Bronx. And the first case that they've started with is someone with a psychiatric illness who was off his medication. So uh, Congressman Murphy from Pennsylvania has made, uh, is making his career on serious mental illness. Uh, we were told when I was there that he was a little known congressman with very little juice and as a result of mental illness has become well known and his stock has gone up. But the real question is, did, uh, who loses as a result of his efforts? He lists all these conditions. He talks about these conditions. And it's important that we understand in the public sector that uh, these conditions uh, attract a lot of attention because they're complex. They often involve medications. And uh, they involve other strategies. Federal legislation, these are a, three bills that are uh, important at the moment, but uh, you should know, and as many of you already know, there are a lot of bills that are introduced. The Helping Families and Mental Health Crisis Act is Murphy's bill, but it, he has uh, over 100 uh, co-sponsors. Uh, he um, is really promoting it. He has been supported by the New York Times, Washington Post, uh, the New York Post, uh, and a host of other uh, media. The key issue is people want to do something. Here's a list of uh, mental health bills in the Congress, and you can see uh, there are many more, actually. I, that's why at the bottom of the slides it says, etc. The key issue is most bills don't uh, become law, but it's clear that people feel that they need to do something. So uh, and in order to do something, they basically want to impose upon the public sector what that something is. One of the first things that Congress does, of course, as you know, is to provide resources. So uh, in providing those resources, for instance, in the FY 2016 budget, they made provisions for $50 million to go through two evidence-based programs addressing early serious mental illness, including psychotic disorders, first episode psychosis. That has become a theme in the Congress, and undoubtedly uh, those of you who are dealing with either mental health issues or both mental health and substance use issues, you're struggling with developing strategies that makes dealing with first episode psychosis important. Congress is all over SAMHSA to deal with it. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't feel that SAMHSA was addressing SMI, so they started to be prescriptive. If you don't mollify the Congress, they start to be prescriptive. Uh, in other words, don't bite the hand that writes your check. Uh, 
They also said, well, we're interested in things like civil unrest. So they appropriated $10 million for uh, communities that faced civil unrest. And these are focusing on high-risk youth and family populations and communities surrounding areas that they experienced trauma. And that's another word that is a very important uh, to all of us, and that is trauma-informed care, trauma issues, both individual trauma and community-level trauma. We tend to focus on individual level trauma, but we need to understand community level trauma. And that's particularly important in the substance abuse arena uh, because we return people to their communities as we focus on outpatient. There's been this increased focus on outpatient as if we're dealing with hypertension. Uh, and as some people say, well, you know, listen, you get me clean and sober, then you send me back to my drug dealing crack house, heroin house, marijuana house bar, and you expect me to stay clean and sober. So uh, SAMHSA was directed to prioritize funding grants uh, from communities uh, that are experiencing these events. The 2016 appropriation included $15 million uh, for assisted outpatient treatment. When, we were at, when I was at SAMHSA, we resisted AOT, and, uh, which may not have been a good thing to do because now they have to deal with it. Um, the Congress wants AOT programs to work with families and courts to allow individuals to obtain treatment while continuing to live in their communities' homes. And this issue of AOT is not going away. Uh, for some reason, it has become the panacea for all that ails you. And the key issue for us to keep in mind that uh, this is a theme that uh, we need to keep in mind it is in the FY. Uh, 2016 budget and the, when I get to the 2017 budget, the Congress uh, has adopted that. So they want to, um, they want us to address these issues. In addition to ALT, prescription drug abuse and heroin use in high risk communities for FY 2016, they provided uh, $25 million, an increase of $13 million to expand services to address prescription drug abuse and heroin use in high risk communities. Major focus as those of you who are reading the, the, uh, the directives from SAMHSA, uh, the newspapers, everyone is focusing on prescription drug abuse and opioid use and opioid overdose. And these are major public health problems, uh, and I don't really want to minimize the gravity of these issues. Overdose deaths are a major problem. But SAMHSA is being directed to, uh, to facilitate medication-assisted treatment and other clinically appropriate services to achieve and maintain abstinence from all opioids. So opioid abstinence is the goal and the objective. And people are struggling to figure out how to deal with pain. They're struggling to figure out how to deal with the physicians who are struggling to figure out how to deal with pain. We don't really know, we didn't spend a lot, although it's been around for a very long time. I suspect somebody, someone reaching my age will tell you. But the key issue is how do you treat it? And so the NIH is working on it, the Congress wants us to work on it. But for substance abuse, the, the balance is medication assisted treatment versus abstinence. There's still this bias that harm reduction is unacceptable for many in Congress, and so they want abstinence. They're not looking at psychosocial improvements in function. They're just looking at abstinence versus non-abstinence. And so that's going to be a political issue that's ongoing. The CDC got $70 million for opioid prescription drug overdose, and they got almost $6 million for illicit opioid use risk factors. We will be working with this issue for some time to come. Um, I'm in the first cohort of baby boomers reaching 70. The other baby boomers are pouring into their seniority, and so uh, pain is going to be the theme of the day. And those of you who believe that you're not going to deal with it, ha. <laughs> and it's an important theme, so how do we cope with that? So people are having their hip replacements and knee replacements, et cetera, et cetera. But the key issue is we need to recognize this is going to be an, an, an ongoing issue. Um, Congress directed SAMHSA for FY 2016 to update its information on counseling, recovery support, and abstinence-based relapse prevention, medication-assisted treatments, and, and need to be fully incorporated. They don't like buprenorphine. They don't like methadone. They like uh, Vivitrol, but uh, that's not the only drug that uh, works. So we just have to keep in mind 
The Congress is being very prescriptive. So that was 2016. The money is focusing on psychosis. The money is focusing on uh, opioids. Um, some of you might ask, well, what happened to alcohol? What happened to marijuana? In California, what happened to methamphetamine? Well, we need to find that out. So SAMHSA came up with six strategic initiatives for this next cohort. This is their second set of uh, uh, strategic initiatives involving prevention of substance abuse and mental illness, health care and health care systems, trauma and justice, recovery support, health information technology, workforce development. This health information technology is going to be an important thing for the behavioral health system because as we move toward integration, which I'll mention, we've got systems that don't communicate. The High Tech Act funded primary care, and then everyone said, oh yeah, there's this whole behavioral health system that exists, and they can't communicate with primary care. Or, as the vendors often do, they uh, sell you what they have on the shelf, and it doesn't communicate with somebody else. Treatment strategies becomes important. It's not on SAMHSA's strategic initiatives, but it's something that we need to keep in mind. At some point, someone's gonna ask, what did you do with the money, and did it help anybody? Process improvement is insufficient. So for 2017, SAMHSA proposes to focus on engaging individuals with serious mental illness, addressing opioid public health crisis, preventing suicide, and maintaining the behavioral health safety net. But they need to keep in mind alcohol, which is the drug, Marijuana, methamphetamine, and tobacco. Our people die from tobacco-related conditions a lot. Uh, and if that's something that we delegate to others. But this the 17 budget then was submitted, and most of you are probably aware of the 17 budget. And this uh, bar graph captures the FY17 budget. This is what the president uh, is putting before the Congress. Um, and uh, the Congress will decide to act on it. Probably a little slower that they're going to act on the Supreme Court nomination. <laughs> but the president has proposed a lot of things. Now, there's a new category, which I'm going to talk about more. It's called mandatory funding, and I'll get to that, which is new. Uh, but in this new category of mandatory funding, there is a proposal to have $590 million um, uh, directed to SAMHSA so that they can explore new initiatives. This $590 million is an interesting thing. They want that money spent on the expansion of Section 223. Now, California was a recipient of the 223 grant. I know you are not a happy recipient of the uh, 223 grant, but they want to expand it to make sure that everyone who applied for 223 money, and this is the certified uh, uh, behavioral health, essentially, centers. They're trying to figure out how to make uh, community and mental health centers the same as federally qualified health centers. So they want to expand this effort. They want to focus on evidence-based interventions. They want to focus on a suicide state pilot comprehensive demo. Uh, that money is going to the CDC. They want the National Health Service Corps to be funded. And uh, this is what the administration wants in their mental health and then tribal behavior health. States are playing a major role in the administration's uh, initiatives. The mandatory funding, $230 million or two-year requests for mandatory funding, $150 million a year for 2017 to 2018. It's a formula grant that would enable all states to establish early intervention programs. Again, psychosis, early psychosis, early intervention. That's the focus at the federal level. Minimum of $700,000 for each state. They want to focus on the block grant set aside. Evidence-based programs which will intervene early in the onset of SMI carrying the 2016 effort forward. Set aside for youth in the prodromal phase. Again, this whole issue remains. They're interested in serious mental illness. And this is what uh, Tim Murphy had brought to the Congress. And it shows you piss off somebody, you wind up, they change your landscape. So, uh, and that's what happened. SAMHSA didn't respond to Murphy's concerns and uh, that turns out to be an issue. Crisis systems, $10 million. Assisted outpatient treatment in FY 2017 continues. The administration has adopted 
Tim Murphy's view of the universe. People want to do something, they don't know quite what to do. Prescription drug and heroin abuse initiatives, CDC and SAMHSA and, um, and HRSA, all involved in this, a billion dollars. Some of you may have heard Michael Botticelli talk about the new $1.1 billion initiative. These are all strategies that are at the federal level. SAMHSA is proposing prescription drug abuse and heroin initiative on the cooperative agreements using mandatory funding. Anybody know what mandatory funding is? Anybody know? No? Okay, this is an important thing. The cohort monitoring evaluation of MAT, $30 million, using mandatory funding. That's all right, I was there for 16 years, we never use mandatory funding. <laughs> but the administration is proposing mandatory funding. MAT for prescription drug abuse and addiction, $50 million. Grants to the states, again, states are gonna play a major role. Now some of you are got grant writers and at the state level, <laughs> you have to decide is if this money actually showed up, would you compete for it? These are issues. Buprenorphine prescribing authority demonstration, $10 million. Grants to prevent prescription drug overdose-related deaths, $12 million. Strategic prevention framework, $10 million. These are issues in the 17 budget. One important thing in the 17 budget is the recognition that its focus on suicide has been on those who are younger, it's zero to 24. Um, they represent 5 million suicide deaths, 5,511 suicide deaths versus those 25 and older that represent 37,262 uh, suicide deaths in 2013, but uh, the money was going to the younger age group. So now they want to change that in order to pursue a zero uh, suicide strategy to prevent suicide, so they want to address the issues across the age range. And we should keep that in mind because the majority of people who commit suicide are actually over 40. So um, that's a very reasonable thing. The funding may or may not materialize, but for public behavior health, these are issues that uh, uh, we need to keep in mind. And FY17, Community Mental Health Services block grant would be $532 million uh, to, again, keep in the 10% set aside for early serious mental illness, including psychotic disorders, and then the substance abuse block grant would be, uh, would be uh, continued at $1.9 billion, working with the states. They want to pursue innovations, peer professional workforce development at $10 million. Everyone is interested in peer professionals, and it's an important component of our delivery system, but we need to make sure that whatever models we use, outcomes becomes an issue. That gives us our pregnant and postpartum women a demonstration. They want a new 25% set aside to explore strategies to serve more women and families in outpatient settings. Now, it sounds good, these outpatient settings. The problem, though, with PPW, pregnant and postpartum women, is that CPS, social, child welfare, they're interested in keeping the baby safe. They don't really care that much about the mother. They know the two are bonded, or should be bonded. But they want to know, is the baby safe? And the problem with outpatient is you can't answer that question. You can't answer that question. That's why drug courts liked residential programs. They knew where people were. And if they weren't there, there was somebody who could take attendance. And so I'm not sure focusing on outpatient, this is Wes Clark speaking, to the exclusion of um, inpatient or residential for PPW is a good idea. It gives the mom time to bond with the kid. It gives CPS time to not wring their hands so much. It allows the system to make sure that both the mom and the child, I should say, the child and the mom are okay. And that's an important issue, because there are jurisdictions, they will lock the mom up and send the child to foster care, and you know what happens when you send the child to foster care. It's a very traumatic experience. It's not that foster parents are not, are not trying to do the best they can. It's just that trying to sever the bond between mom and child turns out to be a very complicated thing. It just does not, just doesn't resolve neatly. 
So uh, it's not clear why the administration has taken this position. I think this whole notion that everything should be outpatient uh, is the issue that's confronting us. But then this issue of the mandatory funding. Why mandatory funding? So this slide, does the use of mandatory funding mean playing political football with behavioral health in the FY 2017 budget? So what else are they doing in the 2017 budget they propose? They want to reduce, zero out, youth violence prevention. They want to reallocate funding to Project AWARE to bring the scale of these school-based activities but not do independent discretionary grants. They want to decrease by $23.9 million uh, primary and behavioral health care integration. But they're telling us we need to integrate. So how do we get the experience with integration? They want to reduce screening brief intervention and referral to treatment. They want to reduce criminal justice activities. They want to reduce treatment systems for homeless because they believe this mandatory funding stream is going to address the problems. Now, mandatory funding of the budget is 60% of the budget. And discretionary funding is 33.5%, and interest on the national debt is 6.5%, which is not a good rate. It's a good rate of return, 6.5%. You know, your credit cards are still 18 to 24%. Mandatory programs are like Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security benefits. What has that got to do with discretionary programs? Mandatory funding, <laughs> mandatory spending, are programs that have already been established by Congress under the so-called authorization laws. These laws establish federal programs and mandate that Congress must appropriate whatever funds are needed. It's a blank check. 20 people show up, you expect a 10, you gotta find money for the, the other 10. That's it. Congress can't reduce the funding for these programs without changing the authorization law itself, and funding can't be changed without an act of Congress. Some authorization laws provide direct spending to recipients, like Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, and others uh, re require or permit periodic review, but Congress has less authority. So if you propose a new initiative on the mandatory funding, which requires a separate law outside of the Appropriations Committee, do you think that's going to be an easy sell, particularly by an administration that's on its way out the door? Do you think? Those of you in the public sector, hey, you go to your county boards or to your state legislatures and say, hey, give me a blank check so I can do whatever I want. Do you think? Is that going to happen? That's the slide about political football. But we're still in the game. We're in the game because this is not just applicable to um, behavioral health research. NIH is getting money through p mandatory funding. They get, uh, NSF gets money through mandatory funding. They get the money from visa fees and oil fees. So behavioral health, they call it payoffs. Unfortunately, the budget doesn't identify what the payoff is. How are you gonna pay for this? And so that's gonna be a problem. So don't hold your breath for the 2017 budget. Uh, but the idea is that the priorities are important. Opioid overdose, SMI with uh, early psychosis and intervention, AOT, these are themes that are recurrent. We still have Medicaid expansion. And I'm not gonna go too far in that, but we know that we have the Medicaid expansion under the ACA. We've got 32 states that have adopted it. And so with the priorities, mental health and substance use disorders, including behavioral health treatment, are an integral part of Medicaid expansion. Opportunities for us all. And that those gives us opportunities for integrated care because CMS is pushing integrated care. They want the ACA to embody integration of care, to incentivize integration through health homes, patient-centered medical homes, accountable care organizations. The uh, ACA wants, it's not mandating, but they want this coordination between behavioral health and uh, primary care. The trick is making sure that primary care works with behavioral health and not just the other way around. We know depression may increase the risk of heart disease, stroke, and older individuals. We know the U.S. Preventive Task Force recommends screening for depression in the general adult population, including pregnant and postpartum women. We know that they're pushing for these strategies to be put in place. 
We know that there are tests for uh, screening, and these tests have to be adopted by primary care. And then what do you do after you do the testing? There are a lot of people that we know we need to deal with in terms of integration. Older adults, people with different languages, sexual minorities. We need to deal with ethnicity and race, those with physical limitations, those with cognitive limitations, undocumented residents. So behavioral health has a full array of individuals that we have to deal with. And right now, that is not uh, in the pipeline. We need to make sure that they, those issues are adequately addressed. Let me separate women out for a second. We also have social justice issues. So in California, Kaiser Family Foundation uh, looked at uh, women 18 and older who reported fair or poor health status. And you'll see that there's a difference in uh, between blacks, whites, and Hispanics. 13% of white women said eh, uh, their health is fair or poor. So the majority of white women don't have problems with their health. But it increases to 23% for African Americans and 31% for Hispanics. But there's one glitch in this whole thing. But when it comes to mental health, everybody's about the same. We got a whole bunch of women who aren't doing too well. And I found this very interesting. The physical health, there are these differences from a social justice disparity point of view, but for mental health, we got a lot of people with mental health problems. We need to figure out how we're going to address this. And so behavior health gets underrated in the discussion. And as you can see, well, even with the disparities, even in a wealthy state, <laughs> that people don't do well. We are also changing 42 CFR Part 2. Now, the reason we have 42 CFR Part 2 is to promote access to treatment, to reduce stigma, to increase confidentiality, and to nurture the doctor-patient relationship. We thought that that was uh, important at the time. But with the advent of EHRs, people feel that, well, you know, confidentiality is not that important. Privacy is not that important. Um, I don't know what you feel, and maybe I'm old school, I still think that privacy is very important. Um, but uh, that's one of the core values, to nurture these things. So it's important for behavioral health to recognize. Now HHS, in its proposal, recognizes that we want to build on the foundation of information sharing to support coordination of patient care. We want to foster the development of an electronic infrastructure for managing and exchanging patient data and increase focus on performance measurement and quality improvement within the healthcare system. I think that last point is the real interest. What are we getting for the money? What are you doing? Not what kind of system you have. How do we save money? Because a lot of substance abuse programs don't have adequate EHRs. So basically, they're still faxing things. And then primary care setting, you have people standing around saying, well, what's a fax? <laughs> I had a procedure done at uh, Kaiser just a couple of years ago. And I had to go in for a pre-op lab study. The system fell, broke down. They were standing around, the staff was standing around saying, what do we do? I said, I'm here for my pre-op evaluation. It's just blood test and an EKG. She said, but our computers are not working. <laughs> a nurse's aide who had been there for, I guess, time immemorial. So we have a few of these forms left. <laughs> you can fill them out <laughs> and go get your blood drawn. <laughs> I said, well, thank you. The more sophisticated and advanced people are standing around saying, huh, huh, huh? So Jim Piles argues that we're concerned about handing a patient a general consent form that will become a de facto standard. These people will be presented these form, consent form at their weakest moment, when they're suffering and the most vulnerable. It's an effort that appears to preserve the patient's right when in practice it sets up a process to ignore it. And I'm teaching a course in behavioral health uh, of uh, public health ethics, and I'm really concerned about uh, the issue of information exchange. And I guess Apple is also concerned about that too. <laughs> FBI wants access to the encryption, and F uh, Apple says, wait a minute. So SAMHSA, in its uh, 
uh, notice of proposed rulemaking. It said, we're striving to facilitate information exchange within healthcare models while addressing legitimate privacy concerns of patients seeking treatment for substance abuse disorder. These concerns include potential loss of employment, loss of housing, loss of child custody, discrimination by medical professionals and insurers, arrest, prosecution, and incarceration. For those of you in the mental health section, those are very real issues for those who had traditionally dealt with substance abuse. And with integration, the question then becomes one of how easy is it to access those data? I'm gonna to get to that again. Big data can be a pipeline to all sorts of information. We need to be dealing with gun violence. Uh, SAMHSA has not been able to deal with this. And this is, from my mind, not a Second Amendment issue. You need to know, if you look at gun violence, accidental discharge of firearms in 2013, 505 deaths. Suicide by fire, firearms, 21,175 deaths. Homicide by firearms, 11,208 deaths, and a total of 33,000 deaths. But 33% of the firearm deaths were due to homicide, 63.8% were due to suicide. That's why our interest in gun control, gun management, however you want to characterize it. I, I believe in the Constitution and the Second Amendment, but I'm struck by these factors. And we need to figure out how to deal with those. We should also keep in mind that there's a race issue. 57% of gun homicide victims are black. Black men are 10 times more likely to be shot and killed than white men. Black women are more than three times more likely to be shot and killed than white women. And when you look at suicide, 93% of gun suicide victims are white. White men are three times more likely to shoot and kill themselves than black men. White women are more than four times more likely to shoot themselves than black women. In the gun control law, there are these categories of pro what they call prohibitors. There are nine categories. One deals with addicts. An unlawful user or an addict of any controlled substance, for example, a person convicted for the use or possession of a controlled substance within the past year, or a person with multiple arrests for the use and possession of a controlled substance within the past five years, with the most recent arrests recurring in the past year, or a person found through a drug test to be used a controlled substance unlawfully provided the test was administered in the past year, cannot receive a gun, buy or sell or transfer. That's one category in behavioral health. The other category is the person adjudicated mental defective. Now the peers freak out about that phrase and I don't know, I, don't, I can understand why, mental defective. Or involuntarily committed to a mental institution or incompetent to handle their own affairs, including dispositions to criminal charges of or, or found not guilty by reason of insanity or found incompetent to stand trial. Incompetent to handle your own affairs is an important thing because you don't have to be adjudicated. You don't have to be adjudicated. So the administration decided, well, they're gonna promulgate an executive order. So their executive order is to increase these, keep, in order to keep guns out of the wrong hands through background checks, increase the number of ATF agents, use the Internet Investigation Center to track illegal online centers, Increase mental health treatment and reporting to the background check system and conduct a sponsor research in gun safety. And we do need more research in gun safety. But one of the things they propose to do is to get information from the Social Security Administration about beneficiaries who are prohibited from processing a firearm. Now, what has the Social Security Administration got to do it? Well, they have, they have 75,000 people receiving disability benefits who have a documented mental health issue and are unable to manage their affairs. So they're using the fact that you've got a payee to take away your Second Amendment rights. Now you agree to get a payee because you want to be responsible, you want to do this, you know. it has nothing to do with whether you're violent or not. When you signed up for Social Security benefits, SSI, it wasn't because you were violent. It was because you wanted to manage your affairs. And having decided to manage your head to help somebody manage your affairs, you're now going to lose your Second Amendment rights. Big data. Now, when I saw this, I don't know, maybe I just freaked out. They didn't sign up for that. You didn't tell them when you, you know, when you get SSI, you'll never be able to own a gun. That wasn't in place. So, as a privacy advocate, what my point is, be wary of big data, because they can change. Now, people are genuinely incorrectly concerned about uh, people with uh, mental illnesses um, 
who get guns and hurt people. Political use this phrase, allowing the mentally ill guns is insane. Talk about discrimination and stigma. So they agree that we should do this. So once we have all these data systems that are interoperable, what are we gonna do? Now HHS also, in, as part of this executive order, um, made it clear that HIPAA does not provide, does not protect the, the sharing of information within ICES, including demographic and other necessary individuals. On one hand, we want to keep guns out of dangerous hands. On the other hand, we should not be labeling non-dangerous people dangerous. On one hand, we want to protect the integrity of individuals. On the other hand, we want to make sure that they're safe and the people around them are safe. So this whole thing about uh, adjudicated mental illness has become an issue. Well, somebody from my generation, Elvis, said we need a little less conversation and a little more action. And I agree with that. What we need to know is, and your role, the public behavior health system, is changing under your stewardship. You're working with very complex issues. You've got recovery principles and social justice issues, but these are issues that are going to be influenced by principles of accountability, efficiency, and effectiveness. What are you doing with the money? What are the outcomes? And that's the complication. New strategies, tools to manage quality and cost, benefit design, provided networks, credentialing, size of the network, control over the network versus hospital monopolies, tiered services and failed first strategies, prior authorization and post-service determination, random and targeted audits, special investigation units for waste, fraud, and abuse, and data gathering for quality measures. These are strategies that are being employed by CMS to deal with Medicaid expansion. These are strategies that the state of California, as all other states, will have to address. And these are issues. The issue of waste, fraud, and abuse, or fraud, waste, and abuse, is a major issue as far as CMS is concerned. So they've promulgated new anti-fraud tools to protect Medicare and Medicaid by shifting from a pay and chase approach toward fraud prevention. They're using algorithms particularly for behavior health, and they consider behavior health a mid-risk environment. So my caveat to you is be mindful of the constructs of fraud, waste, and abuse, because as you venture out into these new frontiers of service delivery, you need to know that Big Brother is watching. And using integrated data systems will certainly make it a lot easier for Big Brother to watch and there should not be fraud, waste, and abuse. But we need to keep in mind that in the public sector, this is an issue for us. You are not alone, and we can do this. We need to know that we can do this. Individual and community problems related to behavioral health can be addressed, must be addressed, by the whole community. You can't do it by yourself. So part of our effort is to use the community to understand the importance of behavioral health issues, substance abuse, and mental health. We need people with lived experiences. We need family members. We need the public health community writ large. We need community health, the faith community, law enforcement, social services, housing, transportation, recreation, child welfare, employers and advocates, and our education system. I hope you use your meeting to understand what a wonderful job you have been doing, what a wonderful job you need to keep doing. You have a lot of work ahead of you. You are not alone. Thank you. Questions? Oh. I made the time. I got seven minutes. <laughs> Did you want to see if there's any, uh, any, questions? any questions? We've got a few minutes left. Yeah. We do have a few minutes for any questions or comments, so maybe you covered it so well they don't have any questions. <laughs> there you Dr. Go. Clark, I'm not sure if this is on, but 
Uh, you mentioned privacy, and I know that SAMHSA just recently released a draft uh, revision to 42 CFR. I have not read the 140 pages or whatever yet, uh, but I was wondering if you had, and does it have a lot of traps that we should be very, very worried about? I've read the 144 pages. I'm trying to digest it. I notice it's reference to stakeholders seems to seem to include institutions and not patients. Uh, I do have some concerns about that. I notice it focuses on giving people informed consent through electronic means, but they're not very explicit on that. And most of my patients really never had electronic means. So instead of giving people written notices at a time uh, when it's appropriate to inform them, there's a focus on um, accommodating the interests of third parties and researchers, um, which is, you know, third party payers and researchers are important, but so are the people who um, present for treatment. You should keep in mind that there's a lot of uh, middle class, there are a lot of, a lot of middle class people who pay out of pocket to keep their privacy. So from the public sector point of view, we don't want a three-tiered system. Those who can afford to pay out of pocket, they don't have to disclose information. So that's one of the problems is that the focus seems to be to respond to people saying, we need to do more research, we need to know more about this. But the ethics of this is, are you actually doing any research to help these people, or are you just doing inf inf research to identify these people? I cited the social security move by the administration. It's not to declare or to help you get SSI, it's to use the information for a purpose that is completely unrelated to SSI. So we're encouraging people, so we need to be careful. When they use stakeholders, it becomes clear that the stakeholders are not people in recovery or people in treatment, but they're institutions, they're big data miners. And, you know, I'm, I just get nervous. And then I see the FBI going to Apple saying, well, we want to crack your encryption code because we are trying to figure something else out. So you need to keep that in mind. Thanks for your talk. I always enjoy hearing you. Um, you mentioned... Um, informed consent when people are under duress. And I think, having worked in methadone maintenance for years, um, we had this sort of concept of ongoing informed consent because when somebody's in withdrawal, of course, they'll sign anything. Um, but also I was thinking, a lot of our treatment systems focus, as you mentioned, on controlling the patient and so, like, for example, in methadone, you have to come to the window every single day and, quote, earn privileges, right? Or in residential, child welfare can want check you off, right? Um, so what, what do you think about when, when the, the person who's seeking treatment and who needs treatment kind of disagrees with us about what treatment should look like, how to negotiate that, what's the ethics of that part? Like they might be in active mode about taking their medication, but in pre-contemplation about needing to change other things in their life and so on. Well, John Stuart Mill argues that uh, there's a harm principle. And the objective that we're trying to do is to help. Some of the basic bioethics principles of beneficence and non-maleficence is to make sure that people participate. So on the other hand, you've got the umbrella of the larger system watching you. So we negotiate a balance between the patient and the system. I think we went to institutional solutions to satisfy the DEA and also to satisfy our lust for money because in some settings, the fewer, the more you saw the patient, the more money you got won. And also, uh, it relieved you of the responsibility of trying to decide whether this person was deviant or not, quote unquote. So. Uh, but increasingly with the ACA, we want participation. We want participation. So we need to see our patients as patients or at least uh, as people who are coming to us for assistance. And that they, in terms of shared decision making, play a major role. Shared decision making is another phrase in modern medicine that's always been the case. People come to the doctor and they don't like what you've got to say, they often say, and then go home and do whatever they want to do. Join me and thank you, Governor.